Jeremiah came from the root of Jesse to restore the preserved ones of Israel to be a light to the Gentiles so that his salvation will extend to the ends of the earth. So the first thing we're talking about here, the Jews are going into Babylonian captivity. That should not discourage the Jews because still they're going to survive as a people and from out of them will come the Messiah. Next, seen in the recognition of the remnant called his people. This is, again is verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand for a second time. You might want to underline that phrase. Second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. Now the Lord is going to recover a remnant of his people as we said a second time. Before we actually get into this uh, phrase, second time, we need to ask ourselves, who are people? Here's where I'm going to cheat on the notes a little bit and kind of cut it back and just lay it out. Because you might be interested, there are three different names that God's chosen people have been known by. First of all, they were called Hebrews. Abraham was the first one to be called a Hebrew. And the word Hebrew means the opposite side. So the idea then of this, uh, of, of, uh, this name is that the descendants of Abraham, who were God's chosen people, on the opposite side of the pagan people. They were to be a totally separate, they were to be a totally different people. So they were called Hebrews, people on the opposite side. Then they were called Israelites. And the first time they're called Israelites is uh, Moses, of course, led them out of uh, slavery. They went to Mount Sinai. They entered into a covenant relationship with God. And they said, yes, we're going to obey the laws of God. We want you to be our God. And as a result of that, entering into that covenant, God says, you shall be called Israelites. Now, the word Israel means to wrestle or to struggle with God. What an apt name for these people. Because the whole history has been a history of struggling with God and struggling with man. But where did the idea initially come from? Remember that Jacob, who's the father of the 12 sons that became the 12 sons of Israel, his name was changed to Israel. Jacob got a new name. His name became Israel. How did it become Israel? Well, I'm going to get real quick through the story because it's found in Genesis chapter 32, and you can uh, look that up. But here it is. Jacob is uh, on his way back from Syria with his wife and children and servants, and uh, he knows he's going to have a meeting with Esau. Esau was his twin brother, you remember, and there was a great rivalry between the two. And uh, in fact, Esau wanted to kill his brother. So before they actually meet, Jacob gets off by himself to have a time of prayer. God, I want you to protect me. You know, I'm, I'm going to see somebody who wants to kill me. And so he actually ends up all night in a wrestling match with a divine person who the scripture refers to as an angel of the Lord. All night long. Sometimes Jacob's on top, sometimes the angel of the Lord is on top. A wrestling match that is going on. And when the sun comes up in the morning, this divine stranger touches the hip of Jacob, puts it out a joint, and from that time on, Jacob walked with a limp. And Jacob got a new name because Jacob is saying, Who are you anyway that's been wrestling with me all night? He never revealed his name to Jacob, but what he said to Jacob was, you're no longer called Jacob. Your name is now Israel because you have wrestled with God. You have struggled with God. What an apt name. Now, you see, it's at Mount Sinai where the law is given that these people now are officially known not as Hebrews but as Israelites. And then, of course, we led them into the promised land 
then the land became known as Israel. So, the nation of Israel, as we know it, goes all the way back to the time when Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land. That's how old that land is, and that's why it belongs to the Jewish people. By the way, the third nation is Jew. So they were Hebrews, they were Israelites, they're Jews. But the word Jew is simply a nickname for the tribe of Judah, which is... Uh, the priestly tribe and the tribe from which the Messiah came. So they're most commonly referred to as Jews. Well, we're talking about the regathering of Israel. The, th the next thing I want you to see here is the recovery again, the second time of the remnant of Israel. What our text says, the Lord shall set up His hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Pathros to Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the island, and gather together the dispersed from the four corners of the earth. You might remember that in the book of Deuteronomy, and it's found there in chapter 28, before Moses died, he wanted to review the law, he wanted to review everything with the children of Israel before he turned his responsibility over to Joshua. And he warned them. He said this, The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the ends of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies a nation whose language you do not understand, and then a swift countenance which does not respect the elderly nor show favor to the young. So what he's saying to the people is, listen, listen here. If you go against the commands and the teachings of God, what is going to happen? A nation is going to come and carry you off into captivity. A nation who speaks a language you will never understand. Then Moses gives this warning. He says, they're going to come back from that captivity, but if you did not learn your lesson, it's going to be worse because you're going to be scattered to the ends of the earth. Notice how he puts it in Deuteronomy 28, beginning at verse 64. The Lord will scatter you from all peoples, or rather among all peoples. Let's start again. The Lord will scatter you among all peoples, from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods, and among the nations you shall find no rest, nor shall the sole of your feet have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart, failing of eyes and anguish of soul. Your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. So, we see two warnings that Moses has given. The first warning is, if you don't follow uh, what God has asked you to do, you're going to be taken into captivity by one nation. However, you're going to come back to your land again, and if you don't straighten out and live again according to how God wants you to live, if you haven't learned your lesson, the next time you're going to be scattered to all the nations of the earth. So we want to talk about the meaning of the second time, but if there's a second time, there has to be a first time, right? That makes sense? So the story is this. Israel is a united nation under three kings. They are Saul and David and Solomon. And they are uh, not subject to any world power. They are their own nation. When Solomon died, Rehoboam, his son, mounted a throne. And what did Rehoboam do? A thing. Just like our president wants to do to us. He wants to raise taxes. He wants to make things hard on the people. And the people says, no, we're not going to put up with that. And so 10 of the 12 tribes broke off, and they became what's known as Israel or Ephraim. They, and they uh, came by the name of Jeroboam. 
And Rehoboam, then, he's the one who under the raised taxes, he becomes king of the southern kingdom of Judah. So that's how it got divided. Now, the uh, northern kingdom of Israel didn't have one godly king in its 208 years of existence. All they did was worship idols. And finally, God got fed up with that. And that's why he sent the Assyrians. We've been talking about how the Assyrians have come, and they took the northern kingdom into Assyrian captivity. The southern kingdom lasted 146 years longer because they had eight righteous kings who ruled over them for 224 years of the 344 years of Judah's history. And then when you come to uh, King Uzziah, who began to rule in 738, that's when Judah began to turn away from the Lord. So about 150 years into their time, they began to act exactly like the northern kingdom, and they began to follow after other gods. And so what happened? That's when God brought the Babylonians in and took them into captivity. And of course, it was the Babylonians who conquered the Assyrians. And so what you have now in the Babylonian captivity is the unity of the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. The twelve tribes are back together again in the Babylonian captivity. Then what happened next? Well, they were in captivity, that is the southern kingdom, for about 70 years. And so God raises up a man by the name of Cyrus, Cyrus the Great. Cyrus was a Persian. The Persians would be modern-day Iraq. So you have the Persians. Now, what did uh, Cyrus do? Cyrus had a war with his grandfather, who was a Mede. The Medes were actually the biggest of the kingdoms at that time. Here you had the Persians. They were just kind of fledging their wings, so to speak, and the Medes much more powerful, but Cyrus the Great conquered his grandfather and merged the two empires together so you have what is known as the Medes and the Persians. Heard about that? And now God is going to anoint Cyrus and say, you are going to release the Jews from Babylonian captivity because he conquered the Babylons. And so now Jews get to go back to their homeland and rebuild the temple, and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. That was destroyed in 586 by Nebuchadnezzar. That is the first return. What Isaiah is talking about is the second return. Are, are we all understanding where we're at here? Okay. This all started... Well, let me, uh, let me change my thoughts here because I, I kind of changed this in my mind. I put notes one way, but last night I'm lying in bed and I'm thinking a little differently. So, let me uh, explain it this way. The uh, Babylonians were conquered by the Medes and the Persians, as we said. Now who comes along? The next is the Grecian Empire. You read about this in, of course, the book of Daniel, but also history itself. And so God raises up a man by the name of Alexander the Great. Uh, he was uh, born about uh, 358 years before. But when Alexander the Great was only 30 years of age, he had conquered the then known world. And he was so depressed because there were no more worlds to conquer that he became died of a drunken stupor. And at the death of Alexander the Great, his kingdom was divided into four sections. This is all talked about in the book of Daniel as well. One of the sections was known as the Seleucid, because a man by the name of Seleucid was one of his generals. And it was the Seleucid section of the divided Grecian Empire that was in control of Israel. It eventually became known as Syria. So the Seleucid section became Syria. 
Now, when you come to the year uh, 165, you meet a man by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. Boy, we've talked about him in this class, have we not? Antiochus Epiphanes, along with Adolf Hitler, are the two most hated individuals by the Jewish people. And what did Antiochus Epiphanes do? Well, he wanted to be another Alexander the Great. And so, uh, the, one of the things that he does, he goes to Jerusalem. And he commits what is known as the abomination of desolation. That is to say, he made the Jewish people offer pigs on the brazen altar of the temple. He put a statue of Jupiter Olympus, or Zeus, the same thing, in the temple and forced the Jewish people to worship this idol. He uh, killed thousands of Jews and all, I mean, all kinds of bad things. That's why the Jewish people have hated this man so much. Now, there was a group in Israel at that time known as the Hasmoneans. It was a family, a Jewish family. They were very influential, they were very political, and they were very militant. And from out of this family came Judas Maccabee. And Judas Maccabee got a ragtag group of soldiers together and went after Antiochus Epiphanes, who's now back in Damascus, Syria, and conquers him, comes back, purifies the temple, and the Jews have Hanukkah. Okay. However, the war was not over yet because the Syrians now come and they are going to attack Israel. And for the next 20 years, there is a war in Israel between the Hasmoneans and this Syrian section of the Grecian Empire until finally a man by the name of Demetrius, who was, uh, he was the, uh, uh, the, the ruler of Syria at this time, he just said, okay, well, I'll just give this land, I'll just give this land to the Jewish people, and he, and he left. And so Syria pulled out of Israel. That's around 145 B.C. And now the Hasmoneans take over, and you have a Hasmonean dynasty forming in Israel for 82 years. Why is this significant? because it is the first time that Israel now is not in subjection to any Gentile power since the time of the Babylonian captivity. But they had 82 years. Okay, that's a little extra information there. I got some of it in your notes, but not as complete as I gave it. Now what happened? We come to the year 63 B.C. The Romans now, under General Pompey, conquered Israel. In 48 B.C., Julius Caesar defeated Pompey and took control of Israel, dividing the nation into three provinces, Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. We know those three provinces very well because they're talked about in Scripture. This was all done by Julius Caesar. So he did not want the land to be called Israel. He wanted it to be Galilee in the north, Samaria in the center, Judea in the south. Jesus referred to the land of Israel as such, but that was it. Now, the Romans in control. But when we come to the year 43 B.C., we meet Herod. He was an Idumean. It's important that you understand what is meant by the word Idumean. The word Idumean is a Greek form of the word Edomite. Who are the Edomites? They are descendants of Esau. Who is Esau? He's the twin brother of Jacob. And remember the problem between Esau and they didn't get along. They hated each other. 
He was also an Arab. So you have a man by the name of Herod who hates the Jews, who is an Edomite, and he's placed as an administrator over Judea. Well, uh, Herod didn't like that title. He wanted to be called King of the Jews. He wanted to rule over them. He didn't want to just administrate. He wanted to be the head boss. And so what he does is he goes to Rome to convince the emperor to make him the king of the Jews. So while he's gone, an Hasmonean, remember this family in Judea, a Hasmonean by the name of Antagonius Mattathias convinced the Parthians, a tribal enemy of Rome, residing in a territory we know as Iraq, to join him in a revolt against Rome. Now, understand who the Parthians, they were excellent with archery. It is said a, a, a Parthian could get on a horse, take a bow and arrow, and hit a target without even looking at it, from, and shoot uh, behind his back. And the Romans were actually very fearful of the Parthians because uh, they were a great threat to the empire at that time. So here is Antigonus getting the Parthians, hey, let's go and capture Judah for the Jewish people. Let's drive the Romans out. And they were doing this where Herod, you see, he's in Rome. And so they were successful in exactly what they wanted to do. And so now, and uh, Antigonius, what he does, he sets up his own Hasmonean dynasty in Judea. Didn't last long, 30 to 37 B.C. So, as we're saying, here's uh, Herod now in, in Rome, and, and uh, he approaches uh, Mark Anthony. Remember Mark Anthony, a Roman politician in general? He says to Herod, hey, drive the Hasmoneans out of Judea and get Judea back in our control again. I'll put in a good word to the emperor, and I bet he make you king of the Jews. So that's exactly what Herod did. And after three years of fighting, Herod's Roman-backed army and Judea, Antigonius was executed, and Herod was declared king of the Jews. This is the same Herod who ordered the deaths of all male infants in Bethlehem because of a prophecy a king would be born in Bethlehem. And that king, of course, a rival to Herod was none other than Jesus Christ. Roman rule pulled, uh, proved very harsh under the Caesars and King Herod. In fact, Herod died shortly after the birth of Jesus. After Herod's death, two of his sons were appointed as rulers of the Jews. They were eventually replaced by a series of governors who continued to make matters worse. The Jews were heavily taxed, and their religion and culture was held in contempt. The Jewish people were further outraged when the Romans took over the appointment of the high priest. We're going to determine who your high priest is. Have no say-so about it. Well, you can imagine that would get them a little upset. And so this gave rise to a group of Jews who became known as the Zealots. And they led a Jewish revolt against Rome in 66 A.D. The revolt led to a siege of Jerusalem by Roman troops in 70 A.D., destroying the temple and much of the city. Tens of thousands of Jews were slaughtered, and millions were scattered to other countries, and a worldwide dispersion began. Well, this uh, actually failed to quell the rebellious spirit of the Jews. Fifty-two years later, they rose up in rebellion again in a well-organized guerrilla campaign that lasted three years, from 132 to 135 A.D. This revolt 
proved to be the last straw for the Romans. Hadrian, the Roman emperor, responded brutally. This resulted in the death of 580,000 Jews and the second worldwide dispersion of Israel. Hadrian renamed the land of Israel, Syria, Palestinia. Why Syria? Well, that's where Antiochus Epiphanes ruled, see? It was Antiochus Epiphanes who committed the abomination of desolation. He was a hated person. And that's exactly what Hadrian do. He wanted to take the two worst enemies of Israel throughout history and rename the land of Israel after them. So we're going to put Syria, and the next is Palestinia. Well, that's the Philistines. And that's eventually where we get the name Palestine or the Palestinians of today. See? So now, the land of Israel is named Syria, Palestinia, because you see, uh, Hadrian wanted the name of Israel blocked from history altogether. This took place in uh, uh, 135 AD. So not only did he rename the country, he renamed the city of Jerusalem. meaning the new city of the Gentiles where no Jew was permitted to enter. While a remnant of Jews has always lived in the land, settling mainly in the Galilee region, for the most part the Jews who survived were scattered over the ends of the earth just as Moses had warned. It was first century Jewish historian Josephus who wrote, There is no city, no tribe, whether Greek or barbarian, in which Jewish law and Jewish customs have not taken root. Yet everywhere they went, the Jews faced persecution. They were blamed for every problem that took place in the land in which they dwelt. In fact, in 1492, under Queen Isabella, of Spain, they were literally expelled from that country. But the Jews would one day return to their homeland and become a nation again. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied that God would deliver them from all the lands and the land He gave their forefathers. You see this in Jeremiah chapter 16, again in chapter 31. The return of the Jews to their homeland called Palestine began as early as 1867. They did so in order to establish a nation of their own with the hopes that this would end anti-Semitism. An Astro-Hungarian journalist by the name of Theodor Herzl, he's the one who spearheaded this movement. Here's something I do not want you to forget. The Jews are beginning to return. They did not enter into war with the few Arabs that were living in the land. Rather, the Rothschild Foundation and the Jewish National Funds helped purchase the land from those Arab landowners. And they, they gave an exorbitant price, far more than what the land was worth. And the Arabs were happy to sell the land. Revisionist history today will tell you that the Jews went in there and conquered the Arabs is an absolute lie. They bought the property. In fact, Jeremiah says so. We have in history other than Jeremiah, but isn't it interesting that Jeremiah the prophet would prophesy this? Here's what he said. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 44. Men will buy fields for money. Sign deeds and seal them. In the cities of Judah, I will cause their captives to return, says the Lord. So when they return to their homeland, they're going to buy property from the Arabs. Now, the land was basically worthless. Mark Twain said in visiting the land in 1867, it was a desolate country given over wholly to weeds. 
There's hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere, even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of the worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. Isn't it interesting that every time Israel is in her land, the land prospers. It's a land overflowing with milk and honey, and as soon as the Jews are driven out of their land, the land becomes a malaria-infested desert. So the Jews kept coming to escape persecution. That's why they, uh, in, in fact, it's interesting, uh, I'm trying to think the two nations now that Herzl was looking at. One of them was Argentina. I can't think of the other one. I, I should have looked this up. I, I, I do know there's a second one. He looked at two different nations for the Jews to, to go to before the land uh, of Palestine. But the people were already headed to Palestine, so he said, hey, you know, let, let, let's, that, that's our homeland anyway. And so the Jews kept coming to escape the persecution. So finally, on May the 14th, 1948, Mr. David Ben-Gurion declared the existence of the independent state of Israel. Israel became a nation in one day, fulfilling another prophecy of Isaiah, found in Isaiah chapter 66. The prophet Isaiah said they would return the second time. Isaiah specifically mentions two directions from which they would come. This is fascinating now. They would come from the north and they would come from the south, he says. This is Isaiah chapter 43. From the north, when communism fell in 1989, anti-Semitism grew in Russia. The Jews were blamed for its collapse. More than a million Russian Jews arrived in Israel from the former Soviet Union. In the early 1990s, they were arriving at a rate of 10,000 per month. From the south, the second largest immigration of black Jews came from Ethiopia in what was called Operation Solomon. These black Jews may well have been the result of a sexual union between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Remember, she visited the king. See this in 2 Chronicles 9. In Acts chapter 8, you have the story of the Ethiopian Jew who came to Jerusalem to observe the Jewish feasts and who was converted to Christianity on his way back to Africa by an evangelist named Philip. You remember that story. In the late 1950s, the Jews of Ethiopia began to feel the tug on their hearts to return to the Jewish homeland. In response, they started migrating to Addis Ababa by the thousands where they camped out at the international airport there in Ethiopia, demanding transportation to Israel. The government refused to let them leave. This was a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, which states that the Jews of the south would be held back. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 6. But in 1991, as the Ethiopian government began to crumble in the midst of a civil war, the United States and Israel intervened, providing bribes to military leaders. The government then relented, and provided a 48-hour window of time for the refugees to depart. The resulting air drift, or airlift, the resulting airlift in May of 1991, that was amazing. In just under 36 hours, 14,000 Ethiopian Jews, namely the entire black population, was flown to Tel Aviv in 40 flights involving 35 aircraft. At one point, there were 28 planes in the air, and the was set when one El Al Boeing 747, designated to carry 350 people, was loaded with 1,086 passengers. This was possible because all the seats had been stripped of the plane, and none of the passengers were allowed to carry any luggage, only the clothes on their back. When they reached Tel Aviv, there was a total of 1,088 on board because two babies had been born en route. This likewise is prophetic. Notice what Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 8 says. 
Behold, I will bring them from the north country. I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth. Among them the blind and the lame. Now get this. And the woman with child and she who is in labor with child, together a great company, they will return here. Isn't it amazing that Jeremiah knew that babies were going to be born on this trip? In the year 2020, I mean, that's just last year. Yes, I'm talking about COVID-19 pandemic. More Jews living in the United States and England moved back to Israel than in any one single year in history from those countries. And they got off the plains. They kissed the ground. The Jews are returning to their homeland, and Isaiah refers to this as the second time. You see, the Jews are still returning. The first time was Babylon, right? The second time from a worldwide dispersion. Now notice, uh, as we get back to Isaiah chapter 11, notice, 13, seen in the reuniting of Ephraim, or Israel, and Judah in the regathering of the Israelites. This kind of relates to, again, last week's lesson. And the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off, the enemies of Judah. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. So all the hatred, the envy, the bitterness that divided Israel is done away with, and the two divided kingdoms shall again become one nation. So you have Israel, the north, the ten tribes, and the two tribes of the south, Judah, they now are one nation. Listen, like we said last week, the ten northern tribes, some people refer to them as what? The lost ten tribes. Remember that? They weren't lost at all. And the nations are united. And Israel becomes a nation for the second time, as happened on May the 14th, 1948. Now get this. There's going to be a banner, the text says. There's going to be a banner for the nations. That's Isaiah 11, 12. This banner will show the nations of the world that there is this new nation called Israel. As we've already seen when we looked at this text earlier, the word that is translated banner is the word for flag. The flag will stand as a banner to the people of the root of Jesse. Now the question is, who is the root of Jesse besides the Messiah? It is David. When Israel became a nation again, the star of David. Okay? Isn't it amazing that here is Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ, telling us that when Israel returns to its homeland for the second time, they will become an independent nation and they will fly a flag that has David. It even gets more exciting. I mean, wait till what's coming up here. I'm going to take a swig here, if you don't mind. It's, it's water, okay. Holy water. Yeah, holy water. Okay. Now notice verses 14 through 16. You see the rage of Israel's neighbors upon her regathering. So Israel has come back to her land. I mean, this has happened in our lifetime. Everybody here was alive when this happened. Notice now the slaughter of the enemy. What? Maybe you. Oh, you're not 48. Oh. Hey, I'm sorry. Most of us. Oh, man. I can't add or subtract the people in this class. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, we'll just forget Don over here and... Uh, Oh, okay. Oh, 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 Michelle, though. Oh, goodness gracious. Oh, man, I'm getting in trouble here. 
I'm used to teaching the fellowshippers. <laughs> okay, let's get on. I'm embarrassed enough. <laughs> oh my, you weren't either. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Notice now the slaughter of the enemy. We'll move on here. But they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Okay, that's the enemy of Israel. Now they're back in their land. 1948's the date. Okay? Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hands on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty fist, he shall shake his fist over the river, and uh, probably the Euphrates there, and strike it in seven streams, and make men cross God. Now the context of these verses is when Israel is back in her land a second time, as we said, and the nations that are mentioned there obviously have new names today, not the same names. The Philistines mentioned in that verse, would be the current Palestinians, they? Edom, Moab, and Ammon, those were uh, tribes that existed in the land of Jordan back in biblical times, see? So they would represent the nation of Jordan. Egypt, the name remains the same. So even before Israel became a nation in 1948, Israel was attacked by five Arab Muslim nations, Lebanon to the north, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. This was Israel's war of independence. Israel was badly outnumbered and outgunned. It looked like their sovereignty over their land was coming to an end. And the Battle of Safid, which is a battle for the city in northern Galilee, which had gone on for months, was worsened. Now notice what the British did. They betrayed Israel now a second time. When was the first time? They reneged on the declaration. Now what do they do? They hand over to Arab troops, troops strategic high points as to how to take the city. We're going to tell you how to defeat the Israelis in this town of Safid in, in Galilee. We're back in 1948 now. An artillery piece nicknamed the Davidica was delivered to the Jews. Surprisingly ineffective, the most notable feature of the Davidica was the tremendous noise it produced when it was set off. A room that the Jews had acquired an atomic bomb, and the entire Arab community left that night. With their exit, morale deteriorated among the Arabs, and the Israelis were able to capture the city. In the same War of Independence, Ira Rappaport's Israeli platoon fought the Jordanian military themselves surrounded by hundreds of Jordanians. So the Jordanians, here they, here's the nation of Jordan, uh, they at the time controlled East Jerusalem, what, what we know today as the West Bank. I didn't bring the map that showed that, but anyway, we'll move on. So anyway, the Jordanians are uh, uh, pretty much in control of Mount Zion. That would be the areas around Jerusalem, including Jerusalem. This platoon that is, Ira Rapport's platoon, had only 25 bullets left. It seemed hopeless. But Ira's platoon was not going down without a fight. Then when they were down to their last few bullets, a cry went out from the Jordanian soldiers, and they began to run away screaming, Abraham! Abraham! Several years later, Ira would come across a familiar face when he came in contact with a former Jordanian soldier who had fought through, uh, who had fought against Ira on Mount Zion. According to him, his army all witnessed a vision of Abraham defending the Jews in the sky above the Israeli platoon, and they had no choice but to drop their weapons and run. Do you see why Israel keeps winning? 
because God is on their side. In October 1956, there was the Sinai Peninsula War with Egypt when President Gamal Nassar seized control of the Suez Canal, cutting off oil supplies to parts of Europe and Israel. Israel invaded the Sinai and regained control of the Suez Canal, opening up the transporting of oil. In June of 1967, there was the famous Six-Day War when Syria, Egypt, Jordan mobilized troops along their border ready to attack Israel. Israel, at this time, launched a preemptive strike, driving the Syrians back to Damascus, the Jordanians back to Amman, the Egyptians back to Cairo, all in six days between June the 5th and June the 10th of 1967. In doing so, they gained control of the Golan Heights from Syria, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem from Jordan, and the Sinai and Gaza Strip from Egypt. In 1979, as part of a peace agreement with Egypt, Israel dismantled settlements in the Sinai and returned the Gaza Strip to Egypt. On June 6, 1973, there was the Yom Kippur War. Well, was celebrating the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. Egypt and Syria led a surprise attack against Israel. They wiped out the entire Israeli Air Force. Prime Minister Golda Meir appealed to the United States for arms, I'll get this, and to the Shah of Iran, who supplied Israel with warplanes. Iran is the biggest enemy of Israel today, but during the reign of the Shah, Jimmy Carter, who got, helped get him out of office and bring the Kolomani in, you know, and yeah. that's when Iran then began to turn against, the yeah, against uh, Israel. But anyway, uh, the Shah provided airplanes. One of the miraculous stories of that war was verified by Israeli historian Lieutenant Zitka Greengold. In the opening day of the war, his small force on the Golan Heights, so we up in the very, you know, the Golan Heights is the very northern part of Israel, once belonged to Syria, consisting of no more than 16 tanks, managed to halt the Syrian advance long enough for reinforcements to join the battle. Kill rate. Had the Syrians convinced they were fighting a much larger tank corps, allowing the Zitka forces to hold off five full Syrian armored divisions with only one or two Israeli Centurion tanks. Well, there were uh, many miracles that enabled Israel to win the Yom Kippur War against what would be insurmountable odds in a place called the Valley of the Tears on the Golan Heights, for example. Less than Israeli centurion tanks were up against 500 Syrian tanks. By the fourth day of that war, Israel had only three tanks left against 150 Syrian tanks. Suddenly, the Syrian forces inexplicably turned around and headed back to Syria. The why was a mystery until a Muslim Mossad interrogated the commander of Syria's 9th Army Division. When asked why he didn't take out those three tanks, he told the Mossad, I would like to see you try to cross the Syrian missile line when you see a whole host of white angels standing right on the missile line and a white band from heaven telling you to stop right there and move no further. Needless to say, I stopped right there and then. God has truly been with Israel. When Israel became a nation, she was surrounded by 22 Arab nations that did not want them in their territory. The combined Arab nations had a land ratio of 662 to 1 and a population ratio of 53 to 1. Yet Israel remains as the only democratic nation in the Middle East, and according to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, once they're back in their land a second time, they will never again be uprooted. Now notice the sureness of Israel's presence in the land in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11. Or actually, I want to begin at verse 16, and then we'll come back to verse 11. 
Verse 16, there will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria. That would be a modern day, uh, probably Iraq. As it was for Israel in that day that he came up from the land of Egypt. Now, I think most Bible believe this is something that's going to be fulfilled in the days of the millennium when the Jews from all over the world are going to return to Israel. So this movement of going back to Israel is still happening all around the world. But when the millennium, when Christ comes back, every Jew will be living in the land of Israel. So God is going to prepare the way for them. That's what this is all about. Even as he dried up the Red Sea in the days of Moses, and the Hebrew children escaped the army of Pharaoh. So God is going to provide for them to get back in a miraculous manner. So in that day, the Gulf of Suez will be dried up to enable Israelites to return from the east. And Cush, which is, uh, that would be um, part of northern Africa. And the Euphrates River will be divided into shallow channels so that the people can return to Israel from the east. The return of the Jews from Assyria perhaps represents all the places from which the Lord come as Assyria was a massive empire in the days of Isaiah. So he's simply using Assyria in this case to say, hey, it was a worldwide empire, and people are going to be returning from all over the world back to the land of Israel. And in the millennium, every single Jew who's on the face of the earth will live there. Okay. We're about done. But I'm chapter 12 because it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting chapter. It's, three, it's only six verses long. It's the response to God by Israel's remnant for His fulfilled promises. That's what this is all about. First of all, chapter 12, the first three verses says, They will praise God for their salvation. And in that day you will say, O oh Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and, your com and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, that's a shortened name for Yahweh, for Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy you shall draw water from the well of salvation. So the remnant of Jews that survive and return to Israel will be thanking the Lord that His anger has been turned away from them. They are now going to be comforted. So when we look back over the history of Israel since 70 A.D., it would appear that God has been very angry with them. They have faced nothing but worldwide persecution and anti-Semitism. And while many have come to know Christ, and they're called Messianic Jews, Still, the majority have been blinded to the fact that Jesus is their Messiah. That's true even today. But the day is coming when the Lord returns a second time. He's coming to earth. We're not talking about the rapture here. We're talking about when His feet land on the Mount of Olives. The day is coming when the Lord will return a second time that a remnant of Jews will look upon Him whom they have pierced and mourn after Him as one mourns after His only Son. And you see this in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12. Isaiah says, a time of comfort is coming to Israel. The reason for this is they will trust in their God and not be afraid. They will see God as Yah. The Lord is my strength and song. Yah. As I said, that, that's shortened for Yahweh, the name of God. These Jews will not only see God as the great I Am, but they will see Him as the Lord of their lives. This causes them to burst into song. Jews and Christians are, uh, are the uh, most singing people of any Christians. You don't find Muslims singing, they just, ah, blah, blah, you know. <laughs> However, Jewish songs are often sung in a minor key and are mournful because it kind of represents their history. Their history hasn't been much to be joyful about. Christian songs, on the other hand, are mostly in a major key and are mostly hopeful, joyous, and full of A day will come when the Jews will have a key change 
because they have found comfort and strength in their God, and they have found joy in Jesus as a fountain of living water, as they will draw water from him who is the well of salvation. And now we look at verses 4 through 6 of chapter 12, and we wrap it up with this. They will proclaim the name of God among the nations. And in that day, Isaiah says, you will say, pray name, declare his deeds among the peoples, make mention that his name is exalted, sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth, cry out and shout, O inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Yes, when you, you know, when you've experienced the joy of your salvation, you can't help but praise the Lord. You can't help but declare his deeds among the people. You cannot help but exalt his name. You cannot help but sing to the Lord. You cannot help but cry out and shout, O oh, inhabitants of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. Amen and amen. You had a whole history of Israel. <laughs> Woo. And when you see the prophecies,